Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another live edition of Mike Up Sports, the show that goes in depth with the people who build our sports community. And joining me is a guest who you might recognize if you were a fan of the television show American Gladiators. She was the season five female grand champion, came back and won two Battle of the Best and an international gladiators title. And not only that, you were also a referee on the kids version of American Gladiators. But before that, she was a Pac-10 champion in the heptathlon at Stanford. You can also find her enshrined in the Upper Arlington High School Athletic Hall of Fame, Peggy Odita Hodel. Peggy, thanks for coming on. And great. I'm curious, since you are now a parent of a Stanford athlete, how often do you get recognized from the American Gladiators run versus getting recognized as being Zolani's mother? <laughs> uh, I don't think there's a lot of people that don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> gladiators and my kids are like oh where's the video I was like oh it's in Ohio you know it's not here with us in California my dad and mom kind of keep it but um, I'll have every now and then it'll be like because uh, I also I coach um, track I coach high jumpers so they'll like look me up and say hey is that you was that you that did that and so that's where it'll come up but in terms of like meeting people and people recognizing me not so much it was a while ago well, that being said, if your offspring or your fellow students that you coach, if they want to uh, find you, I did find reruns on Pluto TV, and that's what <laughs> led me into this <laughs> avenue. So Pluto TV, it's a free online streaming service, and they have a 24-hour channel that runs all the American Gladiators wow. reruns. <laughs> so wow. I went back and watched it, and I'm going, oh, that's right, because... Uh, Growing up as a fan, I was young when the original one came out. I just remember you as one of the contenders who always won. And I think, yeah, you did win all of your matches. So it was always fun to see that. Uh, but your athletic career began long before Gladiators. As we noted, you attended Upper Arlington High School in Ohio and took part in multiple sports. So I'm just wondering, when did you get that first itch for athletics? Oh, wow. Um, probably, I don't know, from very, very, very early on. I remember being in elementary school and I went to a Catholic school actually, and we would have races at recess and it'd be, and I'd be racing all the boys and you know, we'd see who was the fastest person in the high school and we'd set up races and stuff like that. So I guess, Competitive spirit started early, really, really early, uh, elementary school probably, yeah. And on top of that, I've learned through watching the reruns and doing research that you go by Peggy, but your given name is Chinieri? Yes, yes it is, Chinieri, yeah. Chinieri, and if, as I understand it, if I'm correct, it means God gave an Igbo, so uh, if you don't mind, how much does your Nigerian lineage uh, play a part in who you are, what you do? I know that's something uh, you referenced when you were on Gladiators and I actually thought it was cool when I learned that, oh, you went to Stanford long before the Aguma case who helped put a spotlight on the idea that people of Nigerian lineage can be exceptional athletes. As I understand, there was a time where they were stereotyped into fields of medicine and law, not that those aren't good <laughs> right. yeah i know and, and yeah. it's like they're and i know some friends who went to those fields and it's like hey more power to them but you and the aguma case like stanford has a history of athletes yeah. who bought that trend so in a sense i guess you played a trailblazer in that uh, well, i don't know about trailblazer but you know what um having i am 100 percent nigerian both my parents are from nigeria um, when I was introduced to being on Gladiators, my first introduction to it was as, oh, we need international athletes. Do you, does anybody know any international athletes? And my coach at Stanford at the time uh, recommended me because he knew I had dual citizenship. And so I, that was my first introduction at Gladiators as an international athlete. Um, I was representing Nigeria and I actually ended up winning that little, you know, the little international competition they had. Um, uh, again, as a Nigerian athlete, Nigerian American athlete, um, I've had a lot of opportunities to, uh, you know, compete. And and if you know anything about Nigerians, education is extremely extremely important. So, 
yeah, my parents were pushing me, be a doctor, <laughs> be a lawyer, be a this, be a that, you know, education is really important to Nigerians. So, um, and athletics, you know, it's great. And if you're doing well, it's fantastic, but they definitely want to cultivate the, the mind and education. I, I take it. So does your dog. I, I, yeah. I, I heard that. your dog pushes education too. <laughs> Put our dog out in a minute here, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so, you, as you mentioned, dual citizenship, Nigerian American. So growing up, uh, how did you integrate both Nigerian and American <laughs> cultures into your livelihood? Uh, well, just, you know, like I said, growing up in Ohio, um, there is like a small Nigerian community. So um, my parents and our family would definitely uh, like, meet up with other people who were who are Nigerian and you know cultivate the culture always you know so we always had Nigerians around us and I always complained to my mom I was like why didn't you speak Igbo to us because you know then I'd be bilingual or trilingual because you know I can do speak some French and understand some Spanish and um they were like oh well we just wanted you to not have an accent and not have the problems that we had every time that we try to talk to someone and they they're saying what what so I was like uh but you know uh, I'm very proud of uh, my Nigerian heritage and, you know, it, like I said, it's, it, it makes me who I am. Now, I'm curious, growing up, who are some of your role models in athletics? Because you did track and basketball, if I'm correct, at Upper Arlington, but there was no WNBA. The spotlight, the exposure for women's sports, nowhere near what it is now, but I have to imagine being an ambitious driven student athlete you probably looked up to some figures who were the role models in your life that inspired you to go as hard as you did um i as a as, as a heptathlete definitely jackie joining percy was one um i loved michael jordan <laughs> for, you know for his athleticism and drive um i would have to say probably those two were the biggest influences and competitiveness and drive and trying to reach the highest heights. Peggy, I'm a little envious when you brought up Michael Jordan because you were old enough to see him grow from a college basketball star at North Carolina and then make his way through the early years of the Bulls. I had to wait until the tail end of the Bulls dynasty to understand the kind of athlete he is. So it's like, man, you probably remember what he won the NCAA title and his first years with Chicago and all of that, but. Yeah, and the fact that, I mean, I think the biggest thing was that he didn't make his high school basketball team. And right. then to come from that and really be driven to um, succeed and still get after it and still become one of the best basketball players of all time. I think that, I think that was like a big uh, motivator for me, so. That's right. It, it, he was initially cut from the varsity team, I think, in his first year in high school. And then, well, we know the rest of that story. And you are an accomplished athlete yourself. I don't know if you ever got cut from varsity, but you were a three-time state champion in the high jump, long jump. You mentioned being an heptathlete, so versatility was key. Mm -hmm. And when did you sense that your pursuit in athletics could get you places? Um, again, I think very early on, cause I loved to compete, you know, like I said, from elementary school races in the races, you know, in the, on the playground between, you know, boys, girls, whoever would race. Um, I remember actually a time in elementary when I wanted to play, uh, I don't know if it was, I think it was softball or baseball um, with the guys. And they were like, no, you're a girl. <laughs> And I was like, what? what? What does that have to do with it? You know, and I just was so mad. And I remember I just sat down between home plate and third base. And I'm like, you're going to let me play. I'm going to sit here until you let me play. <laughs> well, recess ended and I never got to play. But my competitive spirit definitely like uh, drove me to continue to want to compete and be the best that I could be at whatever I, um, whatever I chose to do, you know, whatever I was doing at the time. What I find most amusing about that story, Peggy, is now we are seeing women competing in traditional men's sports. You may have heard about Sarah Fuller, the first woman yeah. to score 
in a power five football game. There are women's leagues. We have two pro leagues, one for basketball, of course, WNBA, National Women's Hockey League. There's a tackle women's football <laughs> league out there. So it's like, if, <laughs> if that story, if you were a high school athlete now, I mean, folks would be astonished that they wouldn't let you play. Yeah, it, it really, I just, it did make no sense to me. I, 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 we just, I just wanted to play, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, let them play. Yeah, I just wanted to play, you know, and um, I, I, I remember I tell my kids about that. I tell my daughter about that, especially, and she's, she laughs about it. But yeah, so I think, again, the drive was always there to, to um, be competitive and, and try and be successful. Well, those kids who didn't let you play on the baseball diamond, I, think they regretted that decision when they see what you've done <laughs> they probably like yeah we should have let her play <laughs> uh but obviously stanford lets you play by way of your college scholarship or athleticism i'm curious how many offers did you get and if you recall when you got that first offer and what did it mean for you to know you could get an opportunity to continue athletics in college I don't remember how many offers. Uh, there were a lot. There were a lot. I had uh, some coaches come to my house in Ohio to visit with me. Um, I made a few. I think I, it was only three uh, in-person visits to some colleges. Um, I got the Stanford letter, you know, and I remember thinking to myself, "Whoa, this would be, it'll be cool to go to Stanford," you know, and because it hadn't occurred to me, oh, Stanford, you know, I grew up in Ohio, so. I was like, oh, that would be cool, you know, California. And then I guess the communication started. And I was like, wow, I, maybe I could go to California. That would be great. And, and then uh, I think for me, it was between uh, Arizona, University of Arizona and Stanford. And I was like, oh, because I, I really loved Arizona. And I didn't really know a lot about Stanford, except for that it was a great school. And my parents were like, this is, this is not a decision. This your decision's already made. Well, what are you? What are you questioning? <laughs> You're going to go to Stanford, and I don't regret it for a minute. So, and you had a lot of success at Stanford, of course, including a Pac-10 championship in the heptathlon in your senior year. What do you recall from your experience as a college student athlete, and maybe what are some differences and similarities to the experiences that people like your daughter are going through now? Um, it's, it's actually pretty easy to compare because since she's going to the same school, um, on the visits that we took her, when we took her up, um, there to visit and all of the resources are, I mean, Stanford has always had resources, but even more so today for the student athlete, um, with regards to making sure that they're able to get their work done, making sure that they have time, making sure that they are able to do whatever they want to do, even if it's, um, you know, some program that, you know, might take a little bit of time away from training, they, they encourage them to have the full college experience. You know, I know there are some universities that are like, no, you can't, you can't be pre-med or you can't do this major or you can't do that major because it's going to take too much time away from the sport. And Stanford is not one of those universities that does that. They want to make sure that you have your college experience, you have your life experiences at that school and they really support the student athlete. So um, I, yeah, that was one thing that I really appreciated about going there. And, and then again, they've always, they've always had that even when I was, was there. The difference between now and then is their facilities are like the state of the art now. I remember um, the first time I walked into the stadium, the football stadium where, our, where we had our track um, and I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> this is like a professional stadium, like a pro stadium. We had, I mean, not that I'm complaining, but we had some rickety old uh, wooden stadium seats that don't sit on because you're going to get splinters. <laughs> and some of them were broken. They said, don't, we're going to run stadiums, but don't run up this side because, you know, whatever. But I think they always had the plan that they were going to redo the stadium. So they didn't want to, you know, put any money into actually like kind of like, shaping things up or fixing things up because they were going to do a complete overhaul. But the complete overhaul is beautiful. It's really, really a fantastic place uh, for my daughter to be and enjoy at this time. Well, thinking about what you said, 
on Stanford's emphasis on both athletics and academics. Uh, in my head, I'm going, there's a reason NECA and Shanae embrace the nerd nation mm -hmm. <laughs> at Stanford. And I'm sure when word got to you about that, you're like, I know what they're talking about. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I have my Nerd Nation t-shirt. <laughs> so you're a part of Nerd Nation. Um, um, and now your daughter's going to be Nerd Nation for sure. Your, your daughter's repping Nerd Nation now. <laughs> yes, she is. Yes, she is. So yeah, that's great. What did you enjoy most about your time as a student athlete at Stanford? Wow. Um, the most, well, it's hard. It's hard to pick one thing. I, definitely the relationships that I built there, people that I still, you know, still communicate with today and we send Christmas cards and that kind of thing. So the, definitely the relationships. Um, there are a few that have their kid also have their kids going to Stanford. So we kind of get to share the, uh, you know, some of the experiences and, and my daughter talks with their kids because I've got a friend whose son is there and he's a sophomore. So my daughter's a freshman. So he's telling her, oh, okay, take these classes. And this was hard. And if you need help with this, I can help you with that. I mean, it's great. And to have those kind of resources for her has been amazing. And I think it's fantastic. So um, the relations, I think relationships were probably the biggest thing. You graduated in 1990, if I'm correct, from Stanford. Uh, mm -hmm. So there were a few years between that and your American Gladiators appearances. Uh, you mentioned the story of how you got roped into that series. Uh, but <laughs> in those years, I know you were you had Olympic aspirations. I don't know how that turned out, but what did you do between the time you graduated from Stanford and the time you were called up to be a contender on American Gladiators? Well, I did, I did go to Olympic trials in 92 and in 96. Um, didn't go as well as I'd hoped. 92 was probably my best shot. I think I, I finished like in the top 10 or whatever, but 96, I ended up, uh, fouling out in the long jump. So zero points in the long jump for that. And it was over after that, cause there's no catching up. But, um, the experience itself was great. I wouldn't change it. Even if, you know, there's only a few people that actually ever really get to make an Olympic team. And for them, you know, all the kudos in the world, but the, the journey itself even is a learning experience and a growing experience. And I've taken all of the things that I um, learned through that. And I've been helping my kids, you know, get through their soccer and their volleyball and, and, and their track and all their sports, um, helping them uh, kind of navigate the, the ins and outs of sports, um, the mental aspects, the physical aspects, you know, balancing workload, schoolwork, and um, and training, and having had, like I said, having me having had those experiences, I can impart that on into my kids as well as the athletes I train at uh, the high school, the area high school here, uh, Huntington Beach High School, because um, I do coach the high jump there. So, you know, like I said, maybe I didn't make the team or reach the pinnacle, but. I'm very proud of what I was able to accomplish and know that I can take what I've learned and help others and help others uh, reach their heights. I have a friend who is training to be a hopeful Olympian herself. And from the stories that you've told me, I covered the WNBA for 10 years. So mm -hmm. of course I got to uh, meet up with some of the folks who made the women's Olympic team in basketball. It is not, easy to do so like you said the journey and you might think it's easy for you to say you know looking back on everything but I mean if it wasn't for that journey who knows maybe it doesn't lead you to the opportunities that came about through your work in the trials yeah exactly and part of that was your American Gladiators run by the time you were on, the show had been on for a few years. And as I did some research, it had a huge following by that point. There were colleges that would have viewing parties to watch the show. I'm curious, when did you first hear about it? And what led you to apply in hopes of becoming a contender? I... 
I don't think I had really ever watched the show. I'd heard about it, but I hadn't really ever watched the show. And when I got the opportunity to come on to the, the for the first time as an international athlete, I, I watched it then. And I remember, you know, seeing all the games and stuff. And I was like, that doesn't look that hard. <laughs> and so when I got called up and, you know, they take you through all the games and they show you, okay, so this is this game, this is this game. And they show you how to play it and all that stuff. I was surprised at how hard it was. I was really surprised at how hard it was. And I was like, wow, um, yeah, you have to be an athlete. You, there's no couch potatoes <laughs> coming up through this because you know you have to be able to be physical. You have to be able to take a hit. You have to um, be mentally tough because it's an all day event. You know, they tape all day long. You start in the morning and you, know, you might get a lunch break after you know, a period of time and they tape again in the afternoon. So you've got to have the stamina and you know, all of it, the strength, stamina and mental toughness to get through it. I remember uh, uh, when I, like I said, the international competition, it was kind of an abbreviated version. It was a shorter version. So it wasn't, didn't have the full day. So getting through that wasn't that bad. And I, when I got done with that one and I ended up winning, I was like, ooh, that was fun. I was like, I wanna do the regular show, <laughs> the regular show, you know, where you get to go through rounds and all this stuff. And so the next year I went and tried out and, um, they, I made it through all the, you know, requirements. And then the last thing, the last requirement was an interview. So they wanted to interview you. And so I got to the interview and the guy looked up and he's like, Peggy, what are you doing back here? <laughs> and I was like, I didn't think they would remember me. <laughs> I didn't know that they would remember who I was. And I was like, oh, I, yeah, well, I just wanted to try and, you know, see if I could make the regular show. And he's like, okay. So, and then I got the call that I, I made the regular show and they said, oh, we don't usually do this because, you know, once you've been on, you've been on, but, you know, we just thought you were exceptional. So we wanted to bring you back. So that was kind of fun. So you had appeared on the show before, it, it, when you mentioned the international competition, I know they had done some, uh, so did, so you competed before you may be, before you I'm getting tongue tied. So before you were a season five contender, you were yeah. a, a spe okay for a yeah. contender. Okay, for so, a spe so here's the deal. So I oh. went and I did the international show it was like a little tiny show. They had somebody from like, I don't know, Germany or Canada, or whatever, it was small. And I ended up winning that. And then I tried out for the regular show, which was a series, you know, was much longer. Um, and that went over, I think it was like, maybe like six weeks, five or six weeks. So I was there for five or six weeks and ended up winning that show. And then they gave me a call. I called it the gladiator gravy train, <laughs> but they gave me a call and they said, Hey, we're having a champion of champions show. So would you come out for that? I'm like, yeah, I'll come out for that. And I ended up winning that. And then they had said, okay, we are having an internet, another international show, but it's in England and it's going to be bigger. It's in London. It's going to be bigger. And I'm like, yeah, sign me up. I'm there. So I went and did that one. And that was actually, I would say, probably the hardest one because you know again you're flying to a different country and you don't know who you're going to be competing against and those international athletes were serious athletes they they were tough so that was probably one of the tougher competitions but I ended up um, winning that one and then another champion of champions so I've been on gladiators like five different times <laughs> five different but, times but it was it was a great 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 experience I loved every minute of it Okay, I just wanted to be clear because I know about the televised appearances you spoke of and mm -hmm. so we'll go ahead and start with the initial appearance as you said over a six week period in season five you had to go through five rounds, you had to win your half of the season and then the grand championship. And as I was watching reruns of the series. What stuck out to me was how much the gladiators respected you. And in some ways, I don't want to say feared you, but they knew when they drew you in their games, it was not going to be easy. I think toward the end, they were jokingly getting sick of you because you were, <laughs> you were competing and succeeding. And that's what I loved about the original version is was that there was room to cheer for everybody. If the gladiators pitched a shutout, the announcers played that up. If contenders like yourself or Wesley Berry, two scoops, so. <laughs> who uh, broke the game and <laughs> on several occasions uh, but when they succeeded they got a lot of fanfare so everybody 
competing in Gladiator Arena was the star. What do you remember from that season five run? You spoke of the endurance and the stamina, and they compared it to your experience in the hep heptathlon where you have to stay at it. It's not just you play one game and then you're done. You've got to keep coming back and back, and no matter what, you persevered. It, yeah, definitely. If anything, the heptathlon, doing the heptathlon definitely prepares you to be in Gladiator Arena. I, I remember also, I would when we would start the day, um, you know, the competition day at, in Gladiator Arena, I would do my track warm up. You know, I'd go out, I'd run, and then I'd come in and I'd do all my drills and I'd do my stretching. And I remember this one, uh, I don't know if he was a PA or one of the uh, production workers or whatever, was walking by me as I was running outside. He's like, you better save your energy. <laughs> he said, you better save your energy. He's like, no, I got this. I, this is my warm up. This is what I need to do to be ready when they blow that whistle for the first time. And I, for me, it worked well because I was ready to go. I knew there were other people that maybe did, did some stretching and whatever, but it took them a time to build up their warm up. And so they'd be not really warm the first game. By the second game, they were kind of getting warmed up. By the third game, they were ready to go, but that's too late because your points, <laughs> you got to get right. the points from the get go. And so for me, having that track background, having that heptathlon background um, really helped me um, be prepared for what was going to happen in the arena. I think that's a good analogy because in the heptathlon, it's important to get on the board early. Mm -hmm. And on that show, like you talked about, you need those points because the more points you pick up, uh, the more head start time you got for the eliminator. Exactly, exactly. Did you have any favorite events or events that maybe you weren't looking forward to of all the apparatuses you competed in? I liked Powerball <laughs> because it was like football <laughs> and it was fun when you could like, or it was like a mixture of football and basketball. So it was like you could juke people out and, boom, and still, you know, try to make the shots and all. That was fun. And the crowds loved it. And the gladiators, I know they loved like tossing you. So, um, so that was fun for me. Um, one I didn't really like was, I don't even, Atlasphere, I think it was called, Atlasphere, where you're like a little hamster in a big metal ball. <laughs> and you're like trying to push this ball. And I was, uh, I didn't really like that. I don't know. I just feel like I need more physicality and I just felt confined in that space so that wasn't really one of my favorite games yeah i think after your season they dumped atlasphere and swapped it out for a couple other games actually that was one of my favorites growing up because it was kind of ridiculous <laughs> when you're a kid it's but ridiculous is fun when you're seven eight years old and you're watching yeah. these adults go into these giant hamster cages as you describe yeah and, but you realize how hard it was, how hard all the games were. It really was. And I will say one of my favorite moments when I went back and watched episodes of your run was the game Breakthrough and Conquer. Mm. And I think you were going up against Ice maybe in the breakthrough portion of the game. And you <laughs> threw down a little smack talk or threw down the mic, I guess a mic drop moment uh, is what they would call it now. I don't know if you remember this, but you were daring her. It's like you were kind of motioning like, all right, come on, come on. And then you juke her. <laughs> I meant that's all fog. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a little recency bias from watching all of the okay. episodes. But you were kind of daring her to make a move or to come get you, and then you just powered your way through into the end zone. I know that was one event you did uh, well oh in. <laughs> but oh, I'm like, funny. there was a little spunk in you. Like, yeah, there were some contenders who, would, who wouldn't who would dare uh, try to make the gladiators mad like that, but I guess yeah. you were in the zone. We, you know what, there was definitely mutual respect and there were some contenders who thought, you know, they could trash talk and, you know, and be okay, but it was not a good, that was not a good strategy because the gladiators, you know, they have their, you know, pride and, you know, and they would take you down. They ganged up on you and took you down. So, I mean, I definitely had a respect, a mutual respect for all of them. They train hard, they work hard. They were, they're fantastic athletes in their own rights. A lot of them, um, you know, track athletes or, you know, whatever other sports they did. So I definitely had that respect for them. Um, so I it never, you know, it was, it, if there was a, any type of, you know, taunting or whatever, it was kind of in, in jest or whatever. And they knew that and I knew that. So um, definitely had a good rapport with a lot of them.
And that's something I'm glad you brought that up because that was uh, something that was evident all the way from their first season. If you paid them respect, they would give it back to you. you know, they wouldn't let you off easy because they wanted, you know, they wanted to prove themselves like you did. Uh, but it was still was kind of a fun moment where I guess you were feeling it at the time. Uh, but on that point, alluding to the respect that you had for the gladiators and vice versa, the game hang tough. That was, well, there were a lot of events you did well in, but uh, I think by that point you had reached the gladiators platform so many times. And I think it was the championship where you beat Zap. And I think that may have been the second time you got her. She couldn't believe it and jokingly tackled you at the end of the game because she's like, I can't believe you did this to me again. But I could see watching the original run, how much they respected you as a contender as they got to know you through all of your appearances. And so I'm glad you brought that up. So yeah, I did not mean to imply you were like a trash talker or, or oh, something. No, no, I just thought it was no. it, the most yeah, amusing it's, moment it's because- fun. It's all in fun, yeah. it's definitely all in fun, so. Um, so as you were making your way through, the in your season, the first round was a seeding round. So it was kind of a way to, almost like a practice or a preseason. You didn't have to worry about making it to the next round. But from that point on, it was single elimination uh, you had to keep winning to advance as you made your way through each round as what were your emotions and what was going through your mind that when you got when you beat the quarterfinals then the semis then your second half final grand championship as you got closer and closer how did that resonate with you um there's <laughs> There's a saying that my uh, track coach, my college track coach always used to say, he, used, he always used to say, his name, this was Brooks Johnson. So um, he always used to say, what got you here will keep you here. So you don't really need to do any more than what you're doing, stay focused and um, just continue to do what you're doing and you will be successful. So yeah, there were times where I was a little more nervous, but when I get nervous, I get more focused. So um that's all I had to do, you know, was just become more focused and do what I did to get that got me from round to round to round to round. So um, that's kind of how I got through. And then the grand championship, some longtime fans consider that season, that final round, perhaps the best of, of them all. You, it was yourself, Kim Tyler on the women's side, Troy Jackson, Wesley Berry on the men's side, and it had everything, all the makings of a championship sporting event. You had four tremendous athletes. All of you were fighting through injuries or fatigue. In your case, you had a shoulder, I guess, pop yeah. out on the eliminator, which eliminated your head start time and then you see kim on the hand bike sticking past you and i remember your interview saying i've come too far for this to happen i gotta go and then you just turned on the jets yeah. and sweated out the victory what do you remember from that championship because as you said it's over a five six week period but you know much like the gladiators everyone is going through fatigue maybe some injuries and there, there was a level of grit, I think, that maybe you didn't have to use in those early rounds, but that grand championship, it, it, it was exciting to watch. And if that show was produced in the era of social media, I can only imagine some of the chatter that would have followed. But what do you remember from what was an epic showdown for that grand championship? Um, like you said, after uh, that number of weeks and going through all the rounds, you're, you start to get tired. And um, I don't remember my shoulder bothering me that much before. It's just fatigue. And so when I, I think it was the, on the eliminator on the, uh, uh, I can't remember what that thing is called. The hand like, bike? Uh, hand bike, yes. On the hand bike, I, my shoulder just, I, like it did, it just, it popped out and I fell and I was like, oh gosh, what is this? I'm thinking, oh my goodness. And like, I, like you said, I looked up and I'm like, I'm watching her like get by me. And I'm like, okay, calm down. This is what's going through my head. I'm like, okay, calm down. Everything's gotta be deliberate from now on. You know, again, focus, just focus, like laser focus. So as soon as I took my, I think it was a timed penalty and I was able to climb up on the ladder. It was like, I know how to do all of these uh, exercises, these games. So just don't make any mistakes and hit it. Boom, 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 boom. And uh, I think that's what got me through. You know, if I had panicked, or if I'd been kept looking at her and, you know, trying to looking at her, it would have just all fallen apart. But, 
you know, again, just got to like laser focus, focus on what you need to do. What got you there will keep you there. And it, it turned out for the best for me anyway. As the old saying goes, control what you can control. And at that point, you're like, hey, this isn't over. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure. I'm guessing you were trying not to make too much of it or be distracted by outside influences. But once you got back up and could continue and then you passed her again and were able to finish it, when did you sense that? I don't want to say you had this in the bag because Kim was just no. as good an athlete as you were, but mm -hmm. It's not easy to take a fall, incur a penalty, and come back, which I think made that final run more impressive. Yeah, like I said, I, I don't, I know people were screaming. <laughs> I think I remember. I know that, but again, I don't think I heard anything. I, I don't think I heard anything. I just, I think I, like I said, I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, it was slight. Like I'm on the mat. What's happening here? And then I was like, okay. And then it was just like I said, focus. I didn't hear, I was like, I was tunnel vision, honestly. And I remember getting up on the thing and then climbing up the, um, oh gosh, I can't never remember the name, the net, the net. The cargo net. The cargo net. And I remember, you know, again, all of these games, all of these apparatus had specific efficient ways to, to work them. And, you know, you either picked it up by practicing or you picked it up from a tip from someone or whatever, but when you learn the technique, you do the technique. And that for me was invaluable. You know, again, being a heptathlete, it's all, it's all the events are about technique. So if you do the technique, you, you're efficient, you're fast, and you don't make very many mistakes. And even if you do make a mistake, you're able to come back because you're working the technique the whole time. So um, that, and again, the laser focus um, really helped me, really helped me succeed there. Yeah, come to think of it, the Eliminator really was just a mini heptathlon. I, and I yeah. say mini because you had to, you only had to go at it for about a minute as opposed to eight of seven events over two days. But yeah. uh, how relieved and excited were you when you crossed through the, the tape barrier and were able to come back and get that first place finish after falling on the hand bike and nearly yeah. watching it slip away? <sighs> <laughs> I I don't even it's an it's kind of an indescribable thing I, I remember like I said I, when I was able to uh, just like I said focus on what I needed to do didn't have to be super extravagant just be efficient be efficient be efficient and was able to pass her um, and got through it was just like I felt like I like I said it was tunnel vision and I was it felt like I was holding my breath the whole time and then finally when I <laughs> crossed the line I was able to just be like okay, that's done. <laughs> and now the rest. <laughs> so, yeah. And as one of their commentators used to say, even though you won the grand championship, when you get to that point, there are no losers, uh, oh, just a runner up and a champion. And actually the two of you both got to compete in the international mm -hmm. version of the show. But I'm curious, what did that do to change your life and i know that sounds so cliche but you know you won a considerable amount of prize money and when you came back for the battle of the best episodes as they uh, advertised them you spoke of the people who recognized you from that run and then of course you came back and did uh, gladiators 2000 the uh, the kids version oh, of the show oh that was fun <laughs> yeah it, so even it may not have been the olympics but <laughs> <laughs> Millions of people it was got to watch your talent and perseverance culminate in a grand championship. Oh yeah, you know what? The as far as the prize money and stuff, um, it actually allowed me to continue training uh, in the heptathlon because you know it's hard to do that many hours of training and hold a job and train. So. The money that I um, won on the Gladiators actually get, afforded me the ability to continue training with, you know, minimal uh, outside work, having to work out, you know, outside of, you know, the training. So that was that was the benefit of being a, being on these shows, you know, for me, you know, um, doing the kids show. I had a blast doing that and watching those children. I mean, I think they were maybe between the ages of like seven and 10 or seven and 12. I don't remember, but they were young. And I remember I, I was actually called to be like a, a guest referee 
and they were, you know, they would do a game and I, I'll never forget this one kid. He was so, he didn't do too well, but he sat there, his head was down like this. He was so sad. And I was just like, hey, you know, you did your best. You tried your best. You're going to do better the next time. Okay. So, and I would tell him, okay, so on this next game, you know, really try and do this. And it was so fun to be able to help them, you know, and lift their spirits and give them some confidence that they could, you know, to, to be able to move on to the next game and not get bogged down by maybe not having a success in, in the previous game. So that was fun. That was a fun run. Well, the battle of the best shows, so I could understand how, what would lead them to call you back up in that instance, but how in the world did you get to add guests? Well, you were the referee for the entire run. How did that, that's a fun thing to have on the resume. So what led them to approach you about officiating the kids version of the show? Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. They just called me and said, hey, would you like to do this? And I'm like, yeah, that would be fun. And I was like, yeah, that's great. I honestly, I don't know why they called me, but I'm glad they did, you know, so. Yeah, because I remember, again, you have to, I was maybe seven, eight when, <laughs> when that run was on, but it's like, hey, I've seen her before. <laughs> what is she doing here? Uh, but I, I suppose if you win that grand championship, who knows, maybe you don't get that offer. <laughs> but that was the motivation, wasn't it? <laughs> it wasn't the money. It was the... Uh, but when you talk about the gravy train and they said, hey, we'd love to have you back for a battle of the best. And that was a lot of fun, too, because I there were some contenders who I thought, I don't know if they couldn't get a hold of, but that show made stars out of a lot of athletes, not just yourself. And so to come back and compete against fellow grand champions, uh, Kathy Malika and Cheryl Wilson the first time, and then Adrian Sullivan the second time, what, I guess, what was different? What was the same for those all-star editions that you competed in? Um, well, luckily for me, I was still competing in the heptathlon, <laughs> so it wasn't like I had to like, oh, they're calling me to do this again and let me go back and get back in shape. I was, you know, always ready to go during that time. Um, the, the filming wasn't as long, um, so that was a plus, um, but the competing was, you know, definitely, definitely, uh, it, it was like being in the final rounds of the regular show. So, you know, in the beginning of the regular show, you'd have some easier matches and whatever, but uh, the best of the best, it was like being in the, you know, semis, <laughs> semis and finals of uh, the regular show. So the competition level was much higher. So one thing you probably enjoyed was, as you said, the taping was much shorter because you only had to do one show as opposed to five mm -hmm. rounds. Mm -hmm, for sure. <laughs> so, and what do you credit to the successes not only on those specials but when you competed in the international version and again you know being one of the most decorated gladiators and no matter what round you competed in you found a way to win it i mean how surreal was it not only it's hard enough and admirable to win a championship for a season but to come back against fellow champions and in the international version, you're competing against the top contenders and gladiators from every version of the show. You know, that's icing on the cake for lack of a better phrase. Yeah, it was definitely, I mean, I was honored to be able to, like I said, have the opportunity to come back and compete um, in the best of the best. Um, and again, I think I mentioned this earlier, one, the, well, the London international show I did because there was no way to scout who was, there before like these ladies I'd seen them I could go back and look at tape and see where their strengths what were and things like that so that helped but in terms of being on the uh, the international show in London I didn't know who was going to be there you know I, I hadn't seen any of them so and knowing that they they were very strong athletes international you know from Germany and Australia and all the different countries they're very strong athletes so um Coming to do that one for me, like I said, I guess previously was probably the toughest. I know um, there were some great moments during the regular show, uh, the five season show where, you know, you didn't know, oh my gosh, 
she fell. <laughs> I mean, there's drama. It's like building drama and you can't like write that stuff. And similar thing happened when we were in London and there, they call it a travel travelator <laughs> instead of a treadmill, but they call it a travelator. And um, I, I don't know why, but their travelator or their treadmill was steeper than the one in the US. It was different, it was steeper. And I struggled, you know, I struggled like, I'm like at the end of, you know, and that's at the end, it's at the very end of the eliminator. And I remember this one episode <laughs> in London and me and this girl, and we're climbing and we're going boom and we're falling and we're falling, dropping back down and we're running back up and we're falling and we're dropping back down. And I was like, oh my gosh, what's happening? <laughs> what's happening? And I remember sitting there waiting waiting, waiting. And then finally I, you know, I ran up and got up, but my knees were skinned and, you know, it was just awful. And I was like, oh my gosh, that was horrible. And I remember the producer, the director coming up to us and was like, that was great. That was great. It's such good TV. And I was like, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah. So I think what, again, you know, like I said, there are always these tricks and techniques and stuff that you use. And I hadn't really learned figured that one out yet. And I remember Wesley was on that trip with us. Um, he didn't get to compete, but he was on the trip with us. And he gave me a tip on how to, how to beat that. And he said, there is this like board, you know, it's covered in, you know, it's padded red, whatever, but there's this board right where the travel, uh, I keep calling it a travelator, but travelator starts. He said, if you can step on that and jump up, you'll be halfway up the, halfway up the travelator. And then you can just start running. And he's like, you think you can do that? And I was like, well, yeah, I'm a long jumper. <laughs> I can do that. So I guess by the finals, um, at that in that final show, um, I, I, I'm, I think we were kind of neck and neck, me and I think this German girl um, who was, looked like heptathlete. She was like 6'2", you know, blonde, beautiful German girl. <laughs> um, and we both come off the balance beam onto the floor. And I remember I said, okay, he's like, I see it. So I just sprinted for it. I hit that board. I jumped up and I just started running, started running his heart. And it was like three, four steps. And I was already up at the top. And I'm like, whoa, this is great. And, you know, that's how I ended up winning. And I just, I couldn't even describe it again. It was like one of those surreal things. It's like, oh my gosh, I actually did it. I actually did it. But, you know, I got to give Wesley, you know, some props <laughs> on that. Cause he, he definitely helped me with that. Uh, those two scoops of advice really paid off, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as Mike Adamley would would say, when they moved the Travelator to the end, by the time you got on the show, they had moved that treadmill to the end of the Eliminator beforehand. It was at the start, but oh. no matter where it was, there was a saying, the treadmill tells the tale. Right. Or the Travelator in the other versions. It's I mean, it's the same thing. It's <laughs> it's the ramp that nobody wants to go up on at the end of an Eliminator when you're already exhausted and you're just pushing through whatever's left. Yeah, oh, it was tough. <laughs> it was tough. Were there any friendships that you forged that you still maintain? Uh, you mentioned Wesley Berry, and I don't know if you got to jump cars like he did, but you know he was... <laughs> an endearing contender to everybody when you consider his story and you know, that gauntlet run of the international version, still a favorite of mine where he just turned everyone into dust. Um, I don't think, yeah, you, you needed a little more than 9.8 seconds, but you did fairly well in that event too. But of all the contenders, gladiators you got to meet, I don't know where, have any of those friendships, relationships, do they still hold up or and even if they don't, um, How cool was it to be a part of that it, pop um, culture? Oh my gosh. I mean, definitely the friendships. I mean, and Wesley was probably one of uh, the, uh, my uh, great friends that I uh, fostered from that uh, time period. Um, we did keep in touch a little bit afterwards. Um, you know, you got Facebook and with social media, it's really easy to see who's doing what. And every now and then I'll see a, a, an update from somebody and I'll be like, oh, that's what they're doing. And, you know, and um, I remember I was out in LA. I went to some, I don't even remember, some party in LA and Lee Rearman, who's no longer with us, unfortunately, was there. And I was like, oh, Lee, what's up? And it was great to see him. And, you know, so, and I guess, like I said, living, it, living in uh, Southern California makes it easy because this is, you know, where they film Gladiator. So um, you, you got to run into a few 
a few of the gladiators or, you know, communicate with um, some of the contenders too. So, but social media has made it very easy to stay in touch. Well, I'm glad that those friendships you forged all those years ago still hold up uh, because again, when I watched through all the episodes, that's what I loved about the original version. When I watched the second version that NBC produced, I felt that's what was missing. They tried, they almost tried too hard to make a gimmick out of things. And it was like, no, you like, like yourself, you, you spoke of the respect you had for everybody. And to me, that's what made the original run so successful was it had the pomp and circumstance of a pro wrestling event, but they also had mm -hmm. the sense of gravitas from pro sporting events. And to me, it was the perfect combination. And I'll tell you this, Peggy, that show, <laughs> even though I guess you could call me one of the fanboys when I was little, um, that show was the first example I had of women competing in athletics and being successful. Going back to what I said earlier, there was no WNBA, no women's hockey league. There weren't any opportunities outside of the Olympics for women to present themselves as amazing athletes. But on that show, the men and women competed in the same events. There were no mm -hmm. differences in the setup. So you, the eliminator was the same, hang tough, power ball, slingshot, you name it. No changes to the format. And when you're seven, eight years old, you're not thinking about this at a subconscious level, but going back, it's like, yeah, I guess if that show was my first taste and I've covered a lot of women's sports since then, but I do have to give credit to uh, that little show produced in California. Uh, I don't know if you were thinking that actively, you probably were, <laughs> you probably were relieved when it was all done and you could rest up, but to have a chance to share your story like that what do you think that did even if it wasn't part of the groundswell that we saw later on what do you think your participation on that show and the fellow contenders who became champions and successful in their own right what do you think that did to promote the idea that women like yourself can be outstanding athletes um well first of all kudos to the the creatives the producers the directors that saw that that could be, you know, that it could be all equal like that and still be entertaining and, you know, still be profitable and all of that, everything. Um, and not water down stuff for the women, you know, because they were, they're able to do just what the men can do. I, kudos to them for having that vision and putting that out there. Um, for me, I, that was the way I always thought. <laughs> Okay, like I said, from the beginning, I always thought, well, why can't I play baseball with you guys? Why? What's wrong with that? I don't understand. It made no sense. And so to have that show put out in that format to me was like, well, well of course, this is how it should be. You know, I, I, I didn't see it as that it needed to be put out in any other way. So, um, but being able to uh, compete at that level um, in the same events as the, as the men did. I mean, it was, it was great. It was a great experience. We were, again, we were able to share, um, tips and tricks. It wasn't like, oh, well, you're doing a different event. So I can't help you with that. It was like, everybody was able to help everybody, men, women, men and women, women and women, men and men. It was everything. It was great. Um, and, uh, like I said, being able to showcase, uh, athleticism, regardless of your sex was fantastic. So. Now, after the show, I know you s still competed as a track athlete for a few years, but I recall, I don't know if you got a chance to use it, on the international version, you won a trip around the world as they build it. Uh, so after Gladiators, how did you stay involved in athletics? You mentioned being a coach now, and now you have a, a son and daughter of your own with a daughter <laughs> who's, when she's making a uh, articles in the LA Times, uh, you know she's something special. But <laughs> how did you stay involved in athletics after the hoopla of American Gladiators uh, faded? Um, well, I, like I said, I started um, coaching um, at the high school. I, myself, you know, I still try and get out to the gym every day. You know, I'm older, injuries happen. <laughs> you take days off, but you come back. <laughs> Okay, so I, you know, I'm trying to stay as active as I can. 
um, coach at the high school level, help my kids. Um, I did some side uh, uh, private coaching as well for um, runners, sprinters, and jumpers. Um, so for me, that's, you know, in addition to other things, because I, I get kind of bored doing one thing. <laughs> and maybe that's why I did the heptathlon, but I like to, you know, be able to mix it up, do different things. Um, you know, I've got uh, my interior design business and, you know, the coaching and the private coaching and then helping my kids and, you know, making, writing their workouts for them when they aren't able to meet with coaches, we meet with their coaches, especially during this past COVID time. Um, it's, it's kept me definitely busy and it's been very rewarding to know that I can be there to help younger generations come up and be the best that they can be. You know, again, not everyone's going to be an Olympic athlete, but maybe they're going to break a personal best or a personal record that they never thought that they could. And to be a part of that has, has been amazing, you know, so, um, I'm, I'm very lucky in that way. How would you say your experience on American Gladiators and the fame, the hoopla that followed it, how do you think that helped prepare you for your two kids, your son, your daughter, especially when your daughter is getting articles in the LA Times while she's still in high school, I imagine more will be coming her way as a beach volleyball athlete at Stanford. And I thought it was cool that they have a beach volleyball team. Uh, yeah. That's not something you're going to find in Minnesota. Uh, we're a little too, it's <laughs> hey, a little you too never chilly. Know. It's coming. It's you, you, coming. You, you, you know what? You, you, you know what? You're right. You mean soccer? We have a pro team and they sell out all their games. So, hey, and oh, cool. if it's a sport, you know, I'm there. It doesn't matter what kind it is. But seeing all of the publications, all the press your daughter is getting already, how do you think your experience going through that yourself and being a celebrity for a day how do you think that helped when your two kids are now making names for themselves? Yeah, they, they are forging their own paths. Um, you know, Zawani, my daughter, Zawani did like five sports and talking about five sports in like one season was crazy. It was crazy. So she loves to compete. She loves to be competing at a high level. And so for myself and actually my husband who also competed um, in track as a thrower at UCLA. We both, you know, try to help guide them, um, try to help them be, you know, mentally tough, um, let them know, okay, you need to back off a little bit because this is, yeah, you need to like, you, this is for longevity. You're there out for the long haul. You know, this might be happening right now and you really want this right now, but you've got to think about the bigger picture and just being able to impart the experiences that we both have had competing um, at the collegiate level and beyond. Um, and my son who plays soccer, um, just, you know, he's younger. And so he sees his sister doing these great things and he wants to follow in her footsteps and, and be the best that he can be. But again, sometimes we have to like, okay, we're, we're guiding you, you know, maybe you should be doing this instead of this. And, you know, make sure you save time for schoolwork <laughs> and on um, those kinds of things. Just like I said, us both having the, the collegiate experience and the post-collegiate experiences uh, in athletics, um, again, we're able to impart that into our kids and um, give them actually a better shot at being successful than almost we had. Because for me, my parents, my dad was very athletic, but, you know, it wasn't, you know, at the level that, you know, I was able to achieve. So he wasn't really able to give me too, too much you know, they did give me my genetics, so thank you, you know, <laughs> my genetics. But in terms of helping me, you know, navigate certain things, it was like uh, a lot of the times I felt like I was trying to navigate on my own. So for me, being a parent, I really wanted to be there for my kids and let them know, hey, I've been here. I've done this. This is going to be a better path for you. Or, you know, uh, just giving them a more rounded uh, information, more rounded information so also they can make decisions for themselves. And it's, I think it's been really good for both of them to, to be able to get that from uh, myself and my husband. So they can make decisions that will help them to be successful. I have a couple of follow-ups I want to ask you, Peggy. With your husband being a UCLA graduate, how intense is that Pac-12 rivalry? Might be a different story if he came from 
California, but uh, that being said, still in conference. So uh, what does the household turn into uh, in times when those two schools play each other? Well, to be honest, when Zawani was picking schools, it was between UCLA and Stanford. <laughs> so it was like, it was tough. And, and to be fair, my, my husband did, he did um, get uh, accepted to Stanford as well. So he has both of those, you know, perspectives. You know, he had the UCLA perspective. He, he has this, the Stanford perspective, but he chose to go to UCLA because um, he felt that the coaching was going to, he was going to benefit more from the coaching at UCLA. So that was his, his focus, you know, at, at the time. And for me, my focus was like, I'm, I, I want to be a, you know, a well-rounded athlete, but I also, you know, want the advantages that saying having a Stanford degree was going to give me, you know, beyond, beyond school. So, um, yeah, yeah. And I think it goes without saying that rivalry has not interfered with the, the support huh. you and your family have for each no, other. No. But, you know, it's a little fun. I'm sure there's some bragging rights and those football Saturdays and those two go at it. Yeah. <laughs> on the, the other thing I wanted to ask, you touched on this, how your son, your daughter have forged their own path. They're making a name mm -hmm. for themselves. So how proud are you to see them strive and succeed the way you did you know it sounds like you're not interested in any of the wake or afterglow you just want to be there and be their be their mother be their cheerleader yeah. be the parent yeah. you know that's something that you don't always see and i can speak to this with my high school basketball coverage you get some overzealous parents who live vicariously and they don't realize that you know hey they're forging their own path you know mm -hmm. what they did has nothing to says nothing about what you have done, they're going to be successful leaders in their own way. But to see both of them accomplish this much already, your daughter here being a five sport athlete and up here, three sports is a big deal. I'm going five, is she crazy? Yeah. <laughs> but like you said, she's ambitious. And I think both of them have done some modeling too, if my research is oh, yeah. correct. So they've, they've explored a lot of avenues already. And you know, they haven't even finished their college education yet. But for you, what does that mean to you know, see your two offspring create their own destiny? I think as a parent, that is what our responsibility is. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to give them all the tools to be able to go out and do whatever they want to do, what makes them happy and, and, and try to help them to be successful in that way. You know, I've had my time. My husband has had his time. It's not about our time. <laughs> it's about them. You know, it's about, like I said, just giving them all the tools that we can give them to, to have success in their lives. Well, one thing's for sure. I'm going to have to check out a beach volleyball broadcast on Pac-12 Network at some point. You know, now that we've done this, it's like, you know what? I, I might become a Stanford fan, at least in one sport. <laughs> I went to Minnesota, so I'm a gopher through and through. But, you know, like... Uh, there's a few of us that have gone to Stanford, a few Minnesota folks, and it's turned out well. And uh, of course, great school. And like you said, a strong history of athletics and academics. Mm -hmm. Looking back throughout your athletic career, Peggy, and you can include high school, college, American gladiators, anything. What would you say was your most exciting moment and your most embarrassing moment? Oh, through, through my athletic career? <laughs> Well, I say that because hey, I don't want to limit it to just like one show or one experience. You know, what, what the moment you're most proud of or most excited to be a part of and your most embarrassing moment. And I mean, like silly, not like <laughs> just one of those silly moments oh, you laugh gosh. at. This is a hard one because um... I, I suppose you've had a few experiences, so it would be hard. Yeah. <laughs> More than a I few. I mean, definitely. The whole gladiator stint has been, was fantastic. I mean, uh, uh, you know, it's like your 15, whatever minutes of fame and whatever. And it's, it, that was great. And I, you know, and I almost feel like people recognize me for that more than, oh, she was a Stanford athlete, you know, which is fine. I mean, I'm, like I said, very grateful for having the opportunity to have been on the show and everything. So I probably would say that. Um, embarrassing. <laughs> uh, well, it didn't really happen, but it, at the time, I remember when I got done um, with the, the, I think 
the whole gladiators thing. And it maybe was between some champion to champion show and an international show. And I got a call about, Hey, do you want to do um, some pro female wrestling? <laughs> I was like, um, yeah, not me. No, that's not for me. And not to say that it's, you know, a bad thing, but at that time I was like, yeah, no, that's not for me. You know, thank you very much for the opportunity, <laughs> but uh, not my, not my uh, thing. Wow, what what could have been? <laughs> <laughs> Had I done that, I don't know. I was like, yeah, no, I'm still competing. This is not going to work for me. <laughs> I know what you mean, and it, it, you know my attitude on it has changed. Once you realize that pro wrestling is supposed to be over the top and ridiculous, yeah, then I think you learn to right. You learn to have a little more fun because I know, like for me, I'm a big fan of uh, Dwayne Johnson who said yeah. his experience as a pro wrestler helped him transition into an acting career. And I'll never forget when he made that jump, a lot of my college friends who were wrestling fans were like, uh, why did he have to be such a good actor? <laughs> <laughs> and he is good. I mean, oh, I enjoy watching him. Well, he and John Cena, it's like, they just, they know how to have fun. Like I enjoy watching it because they're not afraid to enjoy themselves. And, and <laughs> I could see why maybe you were a little more skittish because like you would say, you weren't over the top. Like the, the closest you came to being a trash talker was that breakthrough and conquer when yeah. you were just doing that little <laughs> can gesture, uh, kind of having a little fun with the gladiators. But by then you've seen them a lot. Um, yeah. Was there a, a moment though in a sporting event where you did something silly and just you look back on it and you just laugh because you're going, I can't believe that happened. <sighs> Man, it's a lot of years, you know. <laughs> um, let me see. Uh, I don't know if I can think of anything right now off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to take some time with that one. <laughs> That'll be in a follow up. So whoever talks to you next, or yeah. if you do your own memoir, here's what happened to me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess, you know, it wasn't so much embarrassing, but I'd say some amusing moments was, I think, when you ran the gauntlet for the last time and you were bummed because you just missed out on picking up the full 10 points because uh, you got 10 if you beat it in 20 seconds, five if you beat it in 25 seconds and you crossed it in 20 and you would just look so disappointed and bummed as you had said. <laughs> But then you perked right back up and said, I don't have to do this anymore. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. were, on to uh, the next. <laughs> to the, yeah. Well, and you know what? In your defense, I would I would agree with that because you know the gauntlet is the only event where you had to go up against all the gladiators in one sitting. And I think that was the draw for that event. And wasn't so much embarrassing, but it was like <laughs> you work so hard and you're like, what? I only get five points for this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, first world problem because you know how many contenders don't get points. I mean, you know, it, it it's not easy as you stated earlier. Uh, you mentioned your career in interior design, and maybe going off of that, a question that I like to ask athletes, past and present, owing to a book that I subscribe to. They say one of their favorite questions is where they have the athletes mentioned the most unusual thing about themselves and they don't mean it in the context of weird but just something that people wouldn't necessarily know if they met you for the first time uh, do you have anything that would fall into that category um are you referring to interior design <laughs> well well just like well anything interest hobbies activities just something that people wouldn't necessarily know if they met you for the first time Um, that before that I did graduate um, Stanford in design and then went to UCLA <laughs> for uh, art interior or uh, what is called the ARC ID program, architecture and interior design program. So that's when I transitioned into having my own business to do interior design. So both me and my husband both have UCLA Stanford affiliations. Um, so yeah, so that would be something that someone might not know. So I guess those rivalry games I mean, aren't as intense as I thought because you both have. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. So yeah. It's like, I suppose in those games, you just cheer for whoever's trailing, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can I, never I go wrong. Stanford. I do lean towards Stanford. And, you know, but if UCLA is playing anyone else, then I'm rooting for UCLA. 
And I take it for beach volleyball, you're Stanford through and through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And I do find that fascinating that you got into the design business and, you know, on the surface, people might not think there's any correlation whatsoever, but how do you think your work in sports as an heptathlete, a heptathlete for Stanford, a multi-sport athlete at Upper Arlington, and then a multi champion in American Gladiators. I can't, uh, re, well, I don't want to say repeat because it's not like they brought you back to do another season, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. How did all of that, how do you think that has carried over into your work in interior design and maybe all the other avenues you pursue? Um, interior design is kind of like project-based work and it's over a period of time. So it's like, and it's a, it's, and every job is different and new. So it's like, okay, and I guess how you can compare it to like maybe gladiators or heptathlon is like, okay, you have all these different events and you know, you're breaking it apart and you're trying to do your best in each section. Interior design is kind of the same thing. It's a project-based timeline. Um, you have certain aspects of, let's say you're doing a kitchen and you've got certain aspects, you've got to um, uh, make sure you've scheduled properly the labor, uh, the design work, making sure you're, you can get your, uh, uh, like faucets and sinks and stuff in at the, at the right time to be installed. It's, it's a management. It's like a whole management of a, of a project. And um, it's, it is kind of relatable. It's kind of relatable um, to, you know, having different parts and pieces that have to culminate to a finish. So, um, so yeah, you could say that, yeah, it, it kind of does translate in that way. Those types of experiences do translate um, to that uh, business. And on top of that, you also are continuing to carry on aspects of your culture that go back to Nigeria, as I was looking up some terms. So your daughter, for example, Zolani, her name, if I'm correct, means grace and goodwill. So that's uh, something you're mm -hmm. continuing to pass on to the next generation. What does that mean for you to be a vessel in that sense? Um, giving, okay, so her name, Zolani, is actually pronounced Kolani, but you know, we've Americanized it <laughs> so that people can see, but it is, it is a South African name, actually. Um, but I, you know, having the whole Nigerian background and everything, I definitely, we're definitely wanting to give names that have meaning and and that kind of thing. So um, for her, I definitely wanted an X name and I don't know why I chose X. And when I saw that name, I was like, ooh, this is perfect, you know? And then to find out it's a boy's name <laughs> later on, but you know, then there, I know, I've known some, we have actually looked up some girls that have the name too, but I think it started out as a boy's name, a uh, South African boy's name. But I, I love that. I love that it's, you know, it's, inter it's interchangeable like that. And um, it makes her unique, you know? I have a theory behind that. I bet there was some latent discomfort or frustration about not being picked to play on the baseball team back at Upper Arlington or wherever you were. And this was your way of paying it back. It elementary, it was elementary. Elementary, yeah. So it's like, all right, if you're not going to let me yeah. play. <laughs> I tease, of course. But uh, yeah. no, that, that is cool. And I, it, it's actually fascinating all the things I've been learning just through this um, interview. And even though American Gladiators has long since passed, I don't know if we'll get another version or not. It's been talked about, but through your work on that show or through your time as a Stanford athlete and a Pac-10 champion, a Hall of Fame member at your high school, what do you think that has done to make you a leader? Hmm. Wow. Um, I'm wondering if, I mean, that's a good question because I, sometimes I think that it, it's in you, it, it's in you. And sometimes it's dormant. Sometimes people don't realize that they have the ability to be a leader. Um, and other times it's like, you know, maybe you think you don't have it, so you never really 
dig deep to, to, to bring it to the surface. But I think everyone has the ability to be a leader um, given whatever situation presents itself. Others, some people are either afraid to take that step. Some people are, what do you call, born leaders and they are just, whoa, I'm out there, you know? And others, you know, it kind of develops through their life experiences. Um, so I guess for me, I, I feel like, I think it's always been there for me. Um, always trying, you know, from, like I said, from elementary school, trying to fight to make sure that I want an opportunity to play baseball. I want an opportunity to compete. I want an opportunity to play. I want an opportunity to be the best that I can be, no matter whether I'm a girl or whether I'm African or, you know, for whatever reason, I want to have equal opportunity, equal chance to, to, to be the best that I can be, you know? So um, I think having had that background growing up and, you know, some struggles with, oh no, you're a girl, you can't play with us. Just, uh, that didn't sit well. <laughs> so always trying to fight, fight, fight um, to be able to, to do what I wanted to do, you know, be able to have the opportunities to do what I wanted to do. And there is one more thing I wanted to touch on since we were on the subject of names. Uh, how did Peggy come about, if you don't mind me asking? I'm guessing it's not yeah. an Americanized version of Chinieri. No. Okay, so how that can, because I asked my parents, I was like, why, why? Because I hated that name. <laughs> <laughs> they said, well, when we first, when my parents first came from Africa, from Nigeria, and, you know, they didn't know anybody. And they said there was this one woman who helped them a lot, helped them set up their apartment, helped them, you know, um, because my dad was a professor and he was, you know, teaching. Um, and my mom was looking for a job and all this stuff. So uh, her name was Peggy. So she really helped them a lot, um, you know, get set up in this country and, you know, uh, showed them the ropes and everything. So that's how they named me that. Um, although it is, it's my, it's my middle name, but, you know, that's why I go by, so. That is a fun story, and I do find it amusing that you despised that name for a time because by the time you got to <laughs> Gladiators and you were becoming well known among the Gladiators and uh, the the announcers, uh, if it wasn't for Peggy, there would be no Peggynator nickname. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's true. What? What? I mean, I'm sure they could have come up with something if you went if you decided to. Uh, go by Chinieri. <laughs> yeah, I don't like, know. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. I'm sure you would have come up with something, but <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else about your history, your background that you would like to share? Um, let's see. I guess um, having, you know, being dual citizenship, having a Nigerian, being Nigerian, um, I had a lot of Nigerians reach out to me on Facebook and, you know, people I didn't know, <laughs> you know, um, um, one of the uh, uh, opportunities I did have as a uh, high school athlete, um, we did this, uh, I think it was called International Sports Exchange at the time, and we got a chance to go to Kenya. And that was amazing. And they had never seen high jumpers that, you know, they did like straddle jump and this and that. And they knew that I was African because Africans, they see it in your face and they know, you know, they can actually tell the difference between a uh, African American person, someone that was born and raised and everything in uh, America and an African, African person. They see it in the face and they know. So when I went to Kenya, they knew <laughs> and um, they, uh, you know, I would was high jumping and they had all the kids come out from the schools like they shut the schools down and they had them all and they were all sitting around the high jump area and all this and um, I remember because uh, they did straddle and we did Fosbury flop and I would jump and I would do my Fosbury and all of a sudden the whole place would erupt with just laughter they'd be laughing 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 and I was like what's so funny <laughs> you know what's so funny but as the bar kept moving up and up and up and I think I I think I cleared like 5'11 or 5'10, 5'11, 6, somewhere close to my PR at the time. And by the time the bar was getting up there and, you know, the people that were doing straddle were out already, they were like, oh, the, the, the whole environment uh, changed. And it was just like, oh, 
and then they'd clap and all this, and that was exciting for me. And and you know, knowing to to share that African heritage um, with those kids, and um, you know, seeing them appreciate what I was what I was doing and what I was bringing to that sport on that day, that was really fun. And that that type of interaction was great to to have. Well, so many stories and so little time. I know you have I an know, appointment. There are a lot. Yeah. My brain is like, oh, I remember that one. And yeah. <laughs> well, you know, maybe we'll have to do this again, or maybe someone else will reach out. <laughs> That's why I started this podcast series was to help archive this history. And I'll tell you this, Peggy, before we wrap up, I did not realize how big a deal American Gladiators was. I thought this was just a show that I was into, but mm-hmm. I've learned that no, it was it was a big deal. Like you were part of a movement in the 90s. And some had said if, you know, the internet followed just a little bit later, if only it had lasted a couple of years longer, who knows, but you made the most of that opportunity and it paved the way to many more. And whether you get recognized from that, your interior design work, or being the parent of a Stanford athlete yourself now, I mean, I, I had a lot of fun. This was a lot of fun to you know, hear your story and how you came to be, not just from gladiators, but all the other facets that make you who you are. And I'm thankful that we got to have this conversation. Yeah, I'm so glad you reached out. That That's great. Thank you for having me. Well, Peggy Odita Hodel, you can cheer on her daughter, if you'd like, for Stanford Beach Volleyball, or you might see her coaching at, what school is it in Huntington Beach? Huntington Beach High School. Huntington Beach. So uh, if you want to check out the Huntington Beach track team when it's safe to have crowds again, uh, you can see <laughs> the next generation of athletes take Peggy's lead, and who knows, maybe uh, they'll find a way maybe They'll find a way to get up that proverbial treadmill in ways you couldn't <laughs> fathom. <laughs> but Peggy, thanks for the time, and thanks for sharing part of your story with us. No, thank you so much. And if you'd like to be a guest on a future episode of this podcast series, just contact us on social media at Be Mike Peden on Twitter or Instagram. All you need is a good story and we'd be happy to share it. So until next time, thanks for watching.